a little fun activity to, to get us started, okay, to help everybody get to know you a little bit. We're just going to call it five good questions, quick hitters. Just give us your, your kind of snap reaction to these. So first of all, uh, walk us through the, the schools you attended, okay? So kind of elementary, middle, and then what was your high school grad year? Absolutely. Okay. So I was at Pinecrest Elementary. Then I went to Hastings Junior High as a sixth mm. grader. Then, oh, excuse me, as a seventh grader. Then it switched to the middle school as an eighth grader. So I was only there two years. I was one of those, I was a lucky class that only had to be in middle school for two years. And then on to Hastings High School and I graduated in 1991. Very cool. Um, so tell us a little bit about your family growing up. Just kind of what was your kind of family unit like? Did you have siblings, do parent or guardian? Uh, who'd you grow up with? Sure. Um, my mom and dad, Dwayne and Barb Growth. Uh, I have an older sister, Kathy, who was seven years older than me. So we had a pretty big span for just the two of us. And we lived outside of Hastings on a farm. So I grew up helping dad. I don't want to make it sound like I helped a lot, but um, helped. And I think at that point, I realized I never wanted to grow up and be living on a farm because it's too much work. But looking back, I think it was good training for for some of the sports and yeah, so, and lots of extended family. I have a lot of aunts and uncles and a lot of them are from town. Very cool. So we're coming at this podcast from an athletics angle, right? So when you think of your, maybe your earliest sports memory, what, what, what was the earliest entry for you into, into sports organized or not? Yeah, um, my older sister, Kathy, was in gymnastics in both junior high and the first part of high school. And so she introduced me to that. She was on a team with some phenomenal, phenomenal gymnasts. So Sue Litschke, uh, I remember going and watching meets when she was competing. And so my sister, Kathy, always kind of helped me learn things at home in the living room, spotting me on back walkovers or handstands. And I got to know some of her friends on the gymnastics team. So um, that was probably the informal side of things. I think the first formal thing I ever did was a little gymnastics class through community ed. And I was probably in mid to late elementary school. I just remember being downstairs at the at the old high school, which is now the middle school in that little gym. and. Um, Monica Pletcher was a good friend of my sister's and I remember her being one of the coaches at that clinic and she kind of helped me along and so that's that's my earliest memory. Very cool. Uh, how about first job either like as a high school kid or as an adult what, what was your first job? You know, I did a lot of babysitting. So definitely that was my first source of income was doing doing that for neighbors and family and then in um, when I was in high school, I worked out at the Chateau. I was a dishwasher and then moved my way up to being a waitress. And I also helped coach um, in middle school. I played volleyball and did gymnastics and track. And then when I got into high school, instead of doing volleyball in the fall, I helped coach the middle school gymnastics team. Got it. So tell us three of your favorite things. And they could come from any part of your life. Favorite food, favorite movie, favorite kind of music, favorite time of the year, favorite favorite anything. Just give us three favorites to get to understand you a little better. Okay, well, um, favorite season, I love the fall. And I think it has to do, one, with the weather. I like that cooler, more comfortable weather. But I like the start of new things. And um, I'm... I'm a teacher, so it's fun that every year the fall starts a brand new school year. And let's see, favorite favorite artist? I was thinking about that, I think is my son. Um, he, our youngest is an artist and I thought, boy, you know, he or he enjoys art, I should say. And so he's good at drawing. And when I was thinking about artists, I thought, man, I love kid art. And when I walk down the school at the elementary or down the hall at the elementary school where I work, I just love seeing all that kid art. And then I thought of Jed and all the art he has done over the years. So he's my favorite artist and my favorite movie is The Shawshank Redemption. Awesome. Thank you. So 
we want to dive into your experiences as a as a student athlete, right? Now I know you're you're coming to this podcast with a lot of different hats on, right? In a cool way. I mean, you're a parent, you have an been a coach, you're a teacher, uh, but I just want to kind of focus on your your part of your own athletic journey uh, for the first part of this. And if you would maybe just walk us through it, you gave us a little intro kind of to your earliest entry into gymnastics or into sport, right? In terms of kind of just an experiment as well as your kind of first formal class, but if you want to take it either in just chronological steps, like elementary, middle, high school, or however you want to kind of describe it to us, just walk us through like what sports did you play, uh, when, and kind of walk us through that pathway for you. Okay. Well, I always loved sports in at Pinecrest with Mr. Tafe as my phi ed teacher. I loved going to gym. It was so much fun. And at that time, we still got to have, I don't know if they still do it, but we had a gymnastics unit and he'd pull out the trampoline and we had a balance beam and it was so much fun. Just loved it. Um, so I think that was, that was some time to get some experience with some of the gymnastics things. Um, we also did a lot of track and field type things in in um, elementary gym class. And I remember hurtling back and forth in the Pinecrest gym with a little Velcro hurdles. <laughs> and so that was a lot of fun. So I also played volleyball, but mainly gymnastics and track were the sports that I enjoyed and pursued the most. Um, I did both in middle school and through high school. Uh, middle school, it was just really, I, I didn't know much going in, Trent. I, I went in as a seventh grader and I really couldn't do a lot, but I wasn't scared to try things. So I think that's probably my biggest asset is I figured, well, if I can do it on the floor and I can do it on this line, why couldn't I do it on the balance beam? And, and looking back, I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's probably a little scary, but I don't know. It, it, it served me well. And so I was gutsy. I didn't mind trying hard things. Um, and if I fell, I got back up and did it again. So I obviously had coaches along the way who encouraged that too. And, and so that, um, that was a lot of fun. And between that seventh and eighth grade year, I think I, I learned I learned a lot just on my own. I, I really didn't do a lot of formal gymnastics. You know, I did a little community ed class when I was in elementary school, but I never went to club. I never did that three, four, five day a week training that a lot of gymnasts do. And I just practiced a lot in my living room, drove my dad crazy because we lived, you know, I was, I was on the upstairs level and I, flip it around, bang it around in the living room. And he was right below me. He had his desk there that he'd do his work at. And he'd yell up, geez, what are you doing up there? And uh, so between that and our backyard is where I learned most of most of the skills that I did. I, I learned how to do the back handsprings and the back flips. So that difference between my seventh grade year and my eighth grade year was was huge. And I came in and I was actually I was I was winning different things at meets and it was really it was fun and really motivating I think you know I'm a pretty competitive person and I like to win and and you know it was poor, it, my my parents really encouraged me too my dad especially he's super competitive and and so I mean I I knew they were proud when I won and I you know I had the ability to do it and I worked hard and and tried to win everything I was doing. So in, in high school, I had um, Sue Litschke or Sue Bauer was my coach. Phenomenal, phenomenal for me. I don't know if she was phenomenal for everyone, but she was phenomenal for me. And she pushed me and pushed me. And sometimes, man, there were times I left that gym and I just hated her. <laughs> I hated her, but um for the most part, I really liked her and she just knew how to push my buttons and to, to get me going in the right way. And um, Dar Olhauser was our assistant coach. And looking back, they were kind of like this good cop, bad cop scenario. And, and Dar, you know, really took care of us and, and Sue just really pushed us. And it was a great combination. We, we had a pretty successful um, high school career. Um, or 
yeah, as a team, I mean, we, we were conference champions when I was in high school. I was able to be or earned um, conference all around champion at that time. So it was, it was really fun. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the gymnastics route of things. And then track, you know, track was just such a fun change from gymnastics because gymnastics, you're stuck in this tiny little gym with the same, I don't know, 10, 20 girls all winter long. <laughs> And then track season would come along and you're outside and then it's co-ed and the guys are around too. And it was just delightful. It was such a fun change. And middle school, I remember we had some student teachers that were really good that kind of helped push. I don't even remember who all the, the middle school coaches were. I know Mr. Vite was new at that time and he started helping a, a you know, we all know he's a good motivator. So he was, he was pushing us along, but um, I really enjoyed hurdling. I liked doing some of the field events and continued that onto high school too. And there, you know, again, we, we were able to earn conference championships when I was in high school for track and um, made it to, to state. In, in both gymnastics and track a few different times. And it was, it was a fun, it was a good run. It was a lot of fun and um, had some, some great coaching along the way and really cool teammates along the way. So how's that? Does that answer? Uh, love it, love it. Okay. So, um, and, and walk us through one more time. Uh, this, is, this is not the moment to be humble, even though we all are. Walk us through real quick, because I know you've captured it there. You've got individual and team conference championships and some state experiences that kind of spread across a couple of your experiences. Can you just focus on that for a minute one more time? Just kind of document for us. Hey, we were, you know, conference champs or I had the opportunity to be individual in this one. Kind of paint that picture for us a little bit more from an accomplishment perspective. Oh, yeah. And so, okay, this is where my memory is going to fail me, I think. So I think at least twice we were team conference champions. Uh, my sophomore year of, or in, in track, my sophomore year of track was a really fun year for me. I, I really, I, I pushed it pretty hard. I had, I had my parents motivating my dad. My dad had this financial motivator for me during track season because he knew that, you know, it's, it's hard to be a student athlete and have a job. And he really wanted me to be able to focus on what I was doing sports wise. So he'd always say, okay, if you get first place in an event, I'll give you a dollar. If you get your second first place, you'll get $2 for that one. If you get a third one, that one's worth $4. And if you get a fourth one, that one's worth $8. So, you know, you can only compete in four events. So I think, okay, to maximize this, I got to get first in all these events so I, I can earn some money. I don't know if that's against the rules now or not, but it, it was so, it was so motivating to me, Trent. And I tried so hard to win every single thing that I was in. And then his other big thing was, um, you know, there's, there's school records that they've kept track of for however long. And he said, you know, if you break a school record this year, I'll, I'll give you $100 if you break a school record. Oh, my eyes probably got as huge as, <laughs> as huge as could be. And, oh, man, I worked so hard to break those stupid records. And really, Trent, that my sophomore year, I broke the record in the 300-meter hurdles was the first record I broke. And I was so excited that I did it. And, and Mr. Sandcamp at the time, he's like, you know, you, you can do this, you can do this, you can, you can even beat that record or you'll beat your own record. And during that season, I broke the record for the 300 hurdles, the 100 meter hurdles and the long jump. So the three individual events I did, I broke those school records and it was so fun. So I, you know, <laughs> I was rolling in the cash with my dad and he's like, oh my gosh, I didn't think you'd break all three of them, but. Anyway, so that was a lot of fun. And um, you said walk, walk through the accomplishments. Let's see, that year I did, I, I made it to the state meet for track in the 100 meter hurdles. And all year, all season long, and the year before too, I always got beat by this girl from Park Cottage Grove. And, and at that time, you know, most of our meets, I felt like they were at 
a lot of our meets. We'd have a lot of meets up at Cottage Grove. They had a really nice track. And so if we were invited to a little invitational, the same the same girl would be there and uh, she always beat me, always beat me. And so I, I had no idea. I mean, I knew I broke that school record, but it doesn't really let you know how you're doing compared to the other athletes in the Metro and in the state. And, you know, I get to the region meet uh, to qualify for state. And of course, Cottage Grove is there. And of course, this girl beats me again. And so, but I get second place and second place is good enough to qualify for state and make it to the state tournament. And then I made it to the finals of the state tournament. And then I, I got fourth place. There was only two other girls between that, that girl that had beat me all year long was the state champion in the hurdles. And I thought, well, that, so how cool all year long, I got to compete against this girl. I had no idea she was that good. I just knew she was always beating me, but it was a great motivator. So I earned all state that year in track and that year also, I, I qualified in the 300 meter hurdles. I wasn't, I never felt as good about that event, but I qualified and I made it to the finals in that one. But I think I ended up like seventh place in the, in the championship heat for that. Um, so I didn't earn all state for, for the 300 hurdles. And then my junior year, I repeated again. I think I got fifth place in state in the 100 hurdles that year. So I earned all state and track my sophomore and junior year. And then as far as gymnastics went, um, same kind of thing. My, my sophomore year was really the year that um, I, I started to realize, you know, I was, I was at the region meet that year and I, I had no idea even how it worked to make it to state. I, I had, I had no clue. I'm just at this meet and I did a really good beam routine. I didn't fall off the beam and I was excited just because I didn't fall. And it wasn't till later in the meet, I realized that um, Sue, my coach, she sat down and talked to my mom and dad. She said, you know, I, I think Debbie might make it to state. And my mom and dad had no clue too. They, they didn't know how it, I mean, you know, you, you want a good score, but I don't think they were watching other kids' scores or anything. And, and I ended up qualifying for state on the balance beam. I think I took second or third place in the region and went on to state and ended up 12th that state, which, um, you know, isn't great once you think about, I, I don't know, there's 30 some girls, I think, that qualify for, for balance beam around the state. But then when people would ask me, you know, how'd you do? And I'd say, well, I got 12. And they'd say, out of how many? And I'd say the whole state of Minnesota, because <laughs> I thought it sounded better than 32 from the different, right. from the different sections. Um, and then gymnastics, I was able to um, qualify for state again, my junior and senior year. So balance beam, um, my sophomore year, all around and floor, my junior year and then back to just balance being my senior year so never never broke the top however many to be up on a podium but i was able to earn state or all state those three years with how they do it for gymnastics so it was that was a good run too it was a lot of fun and as as a team we did well we we did well in our conference i had uh, great teammates. Uh, Nikki Clymer was a, a good friend and a teammate who was a couple years younger than me, but really fun to, to have on the team. And like I said, Sue pushed us really hard and made us work and, and we were tough. I remember being in the, in the conference finals and and I had kind of hurt my arm, hyperextended my elbow before, right before we were getting ready to do floor. And I mean, but I still got out there and I did my best. My handstand was a little ugly, but it worked. And we ended up um, beating Cottage Grove for the conference championship, which was a, which a great honor and very exciting for all of us. So it was, it was good times. Well, I appreciate your willingness to kind of paint that picture, right? It's, I think it's cool for people to hear uh, within a particular sport, right? The different journey uh, individually as a team. Uh, but then just cross-referencing that with with a, a multi-sport experience, right? A completely different season, different focus, different dynamics, and and all that kind of goes into that. So, um, and even though the, some of those specifics 
in places. Yep, they may fade a little bit. You, you've given us a good, I think, understanding of kind of how it all fits together. Let me let me ask you if you if you just think about your whole, your whole experience as a high school athlete, just in general, what was the most rewarding thing about it? Boy, good and tough question. This one will start giving you some tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> it was so easy up until now. Um, you know, I was competitive, Trent, so it was really, it was fun to win. It was fun to, to, uh, to be able to go out and compete and do things that you had worked really hard to learn. Um, you know, obviously, these sports that I focused on were very individual, yet you were still a part of a team. But when it was your turn especially gymnastics, it's your turn and all eyes are on you because you're often the only person going at a, at a time. So everybody there is watching you and you are literally being judged on, on how you do things. So it was really fun to work hard and be able to do well. Now, obviously not every meet went well and um, there were things to learn from each of those experiences, but you know, that's a good life lesson too, that it's not always gonna go perfectly. You don't always have your best meet, but you go out there, do the best you can in the situation that you're in. And yeah, and I think, you know, Sue did, um, Sue Bauer did a lot to prepare us and I remember one time in the gym you know I my least favorite event was the uneven bars I just it didn't come naturally to me and she worked so hard with me to teach me certain skills just so I could put together a, a bar routine that had high difficulty but fit what my body could do because I wasn't a real elegant good swinger and um being able to do these giant swings on the bars, I, it, that just, it wasn't my thing. I, I was strong and I was gutsy, but I didn't have that, that gracefulness that you need on the, uh, on the uneven bars. And we were working on this one skill and, and it was a harder thing. I'd cast up a new handstand. I would come back down and do this funky thing to get to the high bar. And sometimes I'd cast up into my handstand and I'd, I'd kind of tip over the other way. And then I just jump down and, and then she's like, no, no, you, you can't just jump down, you know, because if you tip over, you got to figure out what you're going to do from there. I go, oh, crap, because now, I mean, in gymnastics, so picture this on the bars, you cast up a new hand, say, well, if you tip and turn, you're faced the wrong way and your whole bar routine's messed up. So one day she said, well, then you need to learn this other skill. She goes, you're going to need how to need to learn how to do this so that you can get yourself right back to where you'd need to be and I could not do that thing she wanted me to do and she's like I know you can do it you just got to keep working and Trent I remember looking down at my hands and you know you're wearing you have that white chalk all over your hands and I had that white chalk and red blood just <laughs> dripping down my hands because my they were so ripped that's what we used to say you know you get these rips on your hands and my rips were just bleeding and she just made me do it over and over and over again and finally I got I got this skill and but it wasn't super consistent by any means but I knew I could do it and uh, coming around full circle later it was either that season or the following season at this conference championship meet when we're trying to beat Cottage Park Cottage Grove I'm doing my bar routine. I cast up into my handstand and what do I do? I go too far and I tip and I've got to turn and come down the other way. And just that muscle memory, I, I did what she told me to do. I did that skill. I grabbed up onto that high bar. I got there and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and kept going with my routine and finished. And I remember the judge afterwards saying, you know, because there weren't very many gymnastics judges. So they they knew who you were. They knew what you did for your routine. And this guy said, oh, where was your cool, you know, this skill I was supposed to do. And, and he said, oh, you took that out of your routine. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't mean to take it out of my routine. I just kind of goofed it up and had to do the other thing. And, you know, it all worked out. And I got about the same score I would have gotten if I would have done what I was supposed to do. But I think back and, you know, if Sue wouldn't have pushed me so hard that day, we would not have won that meet because I would have fallen. We would have lost a half a point and 
I mean, it was a close meet. I don't exactly remember what it was, but uh, so it's just cool because that day in the gym when I was looking at those bloody hands, and that was probably one of the days I left the gym just hating my coach. Mm -hmm. And then look at now we're 30 some years later, and I still remember that story of how important it was that she pushed me that hard in that moment to learn something just to be prepared in case. Yeah, that's awesome. It actually kind of leads into the next question I was going to ask you, which is related to that, but but a subtle difference. So pick pick any coach from your entire journey, right? Middle school, high school, any sport, doesn't matter. And I'm not even asking you to define who the best coach was. I'm just asking you to pick only one. Uh, but pick one that okay. was 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 very influential. And what is it that they taught you, you know, that made them so, right? That maybe you still carry with you today or or that what, why that person, right? What was it that they taught you that makes them stick out to you even today? Yep, this is going to be a hard one because I yeah. think that balance between the personalities I had as coaches, because, you know, I've, I've talked about Sue a lot and how she really, really pushed. And I talked about how I liked that difference between gymnastics and track. And I'd leave Sue pushing, pushing, pushing in the gym and I'd move on. And I had Greg Sandcamp as a track coach and he was such a loving, caring man and he could still push and he can still motivate, but in such a different way. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to pick him to talk about now because, you know, he really, he, he kept me going through um, some seasons that, that got pretty tough because not a lot of, not a lot of the girls on the track team really lasted all the way through their senior year. So my sophomore year, there were a lot of juniors that I really loved um, competing with. We had a relay team together and, and they all quit. None of them came out for track their senior year. And I remember running around the track just in a light jog with Mr. Sandcamp. And he's like, okay, well, this is, this is gonna be a lot different. And you know, why do you think why do you think they didn't come back out? And you know, I don't even remember all the pieces of that conversation, but just that reassurance that he gave me that, you know, we'd still be able to have a good season. Um, I, I really felt it was really fun and I really felt cared for during, during track. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of coaches out there too. Like uh, Mr. Cruz was helping with hurdles and, you know, you, you worked out with the guys a lot too. So it wasn't just the girls only together and just the girls coaches, you know, there, there were a lot of different uh, moving parts out on that, out on that track, but, you know, he just always created an environment that just felt so, so safe to, you know, try new things and yeah, it, but he was so soft, soft spoken. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure how he did it, Trent, but he was, he was just a great guy. I remember after, after getting fourth place in state, my sophomore year in hurdles and your, your fourth place ribbon come is a, is a yellow ribbon. And I remember Mr. Sandcamp putting his arm around me and he's like, oh, maybe next year we can get you that blue ribbon. You know, and he, he was thinking that maybe I could push myself to, you know, to end up being a state champion. And, and yeah, I, another fun story about, about track and about Mr. Sandcamp. We, it was one of our big meets at the end of the year, but it was, you know, track, you have pre preliminaries and I mean, you know this, but you have your prelim meet to, to decide who's going to be able to come back two days later to compete in the finals. And I'm in the prelims for the 300 hurdles and, you know, we, we want to win, we want to win the conference meet. So everything everybody does is really important. And, and I take off running for the 300 hurdles and, and I was one of the the better hurdlers in our conference. So I had a, a pretty nice preliminary heat to be in. And I, I took off run and I came around the corner and I knocked into a hurdle and I flipped over and fell, but the gymnast in me just rolled and got back up and kept running. And I still won that heat. And oh my gosh, my coaches, they got such a kick out of that as did, as did people that were there watching. And 
And so that part was really fun and funny because, you know, I, I really, I didn't miss much of a beat because, you know, if a gymnast can't do a forward roll, we're in big trouble. So I just forward roll and kept running. But what was really scary then was going into that finals the two days later, thinking, oh my gosh, I, I really wiped out last time I did this and that can't happen in a, in a final heat because I'm not going to win if I'm against all the best girls in the conference. And I do that. And I just remember him just really calming me down and just that mental piece of it, just talking me through of, you know, I've done this how many times I don't fall all that often, but I've, I, I did in that important one. And, um, and Mr. McCoy too, I remember them both really helping me through that. And, and when it came down to it, I, I did not fall in that in that final heat. And that was one of the conference championships that we won. It was pretty cool. Awesome. Love it. Well, let's shift from a coach to a teammate. Same thing. Any stage, middle school, high school, any sport. Who Who's a teammate that stands out as, as one that was uh, not necessarily like the best teammate, but, but kind of maybe the most significant teammate that you ever played with and, and why? Why would you say that? How do they influence you or what did you learn from them? Yeah, Trent, I had a lot of cool teammates. I, oh man, you know, thinking back, if I have to pick one person, I'm going to pick um, Heidi Tegland, um, who is now Heidi McCabe. She lives in town. She has a couple daughters that are really good gymnasts. Um, Heidi and I were, we were good friends and good, good teammates. And we were really good at pushing each other and, and making things fun. I remember, I mean, everybody knows how to play pig when you play basketball, right? You're a pig or horse. And Heidi and I, we had our own game of pig or horse with gymnastics. And we'd get up on the balance beam and you had to do something and the other person had to get up and then do that same skill. And if you if you fell on it, then you earned a letter. And we got ourselves to work really hard and learn new things and and it was a pressure situation that wasn't in a meet yet it was still competitive. And so, you know, we, we pushed each other through that and, and she was just always such a nice, sweet person. Uh, we did a couple different summer things together. There was one year that we went up to cottage Grove. They had a little gymnastics clinic that some of the park coaches ran during the summer and Heidi and I went up and trained with them for a little while and I don't know she was she was always there and then the other thing she'd always do for me which uh, thinking back is kind of funny so I've always had I have um, poor vision and when you do vault in gymnastics you start way back at the end of the runway and the judges they'll acknowledge you when you can go ahead and take off running and do your vault and depending, sometimes they'd just raise a little flag or raise a finger, or sometimes they'd raise their arm up nice and high, but sometimes I couldn't see them. <laughs> so that was this little nerve wracking thing for me. It's like, oh my gosh, what if I can't see the person? And, and Heidi would always, she'd sit down at the end of the vault runway with me and she'd say, okay. <laughs> and then I'd know that I could acknowledge it and go do my vault. But I mean, so from, from, a practice buddy who really pushed me and motivated me to a kind friend that was there to say, okay, there you, it's your turn to go. They're raising their hand. She was just a, a wonderful person. And we, you know, we still talk on and off, you know, to this day, she's just a great, great friend and a lot of good memories. Cool. Well, tell us a little bit too, uh, a little bit more, I would say, about just your improvement or training process, right? You gave us a couple of fun stories, right, about your dad's, uh, um, you know, support, right, which is cool. Um, and also, you talked about um, just, you know, your own willingness to 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 work on your own, even if it didn't necessarily wasn't work early, right? If you were working on gymnastics upstairs, I'm sure it was because it was fun, and then at some point, a transition to, hey, I'm going to do this to get better at. But I guess my point is. As you transitioned into a more focused, more competitive high school athlete, what one or two things would you say were a core part of your, your, your preparation or your training or things that you did just to make sure that you were continuing to get better? Wow, another great question. Because like I said, I didn't do a lot of the formal 
I didn't do a lot of the formal stuff that athletes do. And at that time, gymnasts were doing it then too. I know, you know, in these past 30 years, I mean, it has just blown up how much kids are kind of focusing on one sport. And, um, but at that time, you know, gymnasts, gymnasts did that. They, they were at club and they were practicing all the time. And, and I just didn't, I think I, I stayed strong you know, technically I wasn't, I wasn't awesome. I, I didn't have those base, base skills, like the little girls that start when they're four and they learn how to do this specific thing exactly the way you're supposed to. I never, I never learned the right way to do things, but like I said, I, I was gutsy and I wasn't scared to try things. So just that, that in itself took me a long ways. Um, my you know, I mentioned growing up on a farm and I think back to, you know, this is before cell phones. My, my mom would say, Hey, run out. Dad's out in the field, run out and tell him that so-and-so called, he needs to come in and call him. And I'd take off running Trent and I'd, you know, and I'd probably run a half a mile to go out to the field to tell dad. And, you know, it's not like running on a track, (laughs) there's changes in the field. And it was just so, and I just had so much fun just running as fast as I could to, to get out there. And I'd be hurtling over this and doing whatever. And when we'd bail hay and I'd be on the hay wagon and dad would be driving the tractor and the hay wagon, you know, it's, it's built with a bunch of two by fours is the, is the floor of it. Well, a balance beam is four inches wide and I would do my balance beam routine on those planks of the, of the wagon. And sometimes I do it as he was driving down the road. <laughs> so I love it. And I mean, nobody trains like that, but I mean, like, gosh, I, I trained like that. I would, and if, man, yeah. if you can stay on that beam while it's driving down the street on a rickety wagon, then it's not so hard when you're in a gym and you've got mats under, <laughs> underneath you. So very unorthodox, right? But it, it was fun. And I, I liked the, I liked the variability of it. I, I don't think I probably would have been a very good club gymnast. I think I would have gotten really bored doing those things over and over and over and over again. I just, I liked learning new things and having new challenges. And luckily I think I hit a window of time in gymnastics that, you know, it really helped if you were a club gymnast, but me as a non-club gymnast could still come in and have a successful high school career sure. because I, I had good coaching. And like I said, I mean, Sue knew just how to take the skills that I had and teach me what made sense for me so that I had a difficult enough routine to be able to score high. And um, so that, yeah. does that answer that? For sure. I mean, of course, okay. I mean, we're living in an era of, you know, kids hopping on mopeds and hoverboards as opposed to riding bikes and running, you know, or, or walking somewhere. And then so much of their experience as either athletes or with their hobbies is always controlled, you know, controlled either by adults or by air conditioning, or, I mean, everything is so boxed, you know, so it's, it's fascinating to hear you describe the different ways in which your prep wasn't like that at all. Um, and not in a bad way. So I, I appreciate you walking us through that a little bit. Um, just as a quick aside, anything in particular, um, I know sports, obviously being a multi-sport athlete and then growing up on a farm, that that's enough. But was there anything outside of those that you enjoyed? Did you have any kind of hobbies or passions that weren't athletic related that, that you really like to do? Yeah, I, I liked hanging out with my friends. And um, yeah, I mean, I was a, I was a girl, we'd go shopping and the, you know, I, nothing that stands out as some big other activity that we always did, but yeah, I I loved being with my friends on the weekends and, and I will say it it was a challenge to be a high school athlete because, and, and I followed the rules. And so I didn't, I didn't drink or anything during, during high school. And, you know, I think that's a rarity and I remember, you know, I'd still go to the parties and stuff, but I just, I didn't drink. And I know that has changed the, the rules that kind of go with that. And um, I, I kind of got into some arguments and was pretty passionate about 
about those rules because I I just think it was so important for me to still be able to hang out with my friends. And if that's what they were choosing to do, because not all of them were athletes, that's what they were choosing to do. That's what they were choosing to do. But I, I didn't partake. I was a sober cab for them. And um, I don't know, I think that that piece has changed a lot too. And I remember being in a in a high school class and we had a parent panel come in and they talked about how you know, kids shouldn't be at parties. And if I was an athlete, there's no way I should at, be at those things. And I said, hey, you know what? You want me at that party. I said, you want this responsible person to be there and to be able to make some good judgment calls and, and get people home that maybe need a ride home. But okay, that was totally aside, yeah, but right. just right. a piece of... Um, of Part of your you know, what, what, yeah, yeah what it is to yeah. be a student athlete and that you, you kind of give up some things and I think now our athletes probably have to give up even more or they're just breaking the rules and not getting caught so yeah no that's that's well said how about in general um you know as a student and in this case as a student athlete what did the broader community of Hastings mean to you at that time You know, it was it was really it was rewarding and it was fun because you know at that time the Hastings Star Gazette I think did a really good job with sports and and so you know pe people knew what was happening and and plus you know like parents my parents and their friends I think you know they have a, a vested interest because <laughs> they know someone who's competing in these sports uh, but I, I always felt really well supported I remember one time being at a store and someone said hey I think I know you and she recognized me from an article in in the Hastings paper and it was some gymnastics article and it's like wow I just it was cool it's a cool place to to be a small enough community where you know you know the people around you and they they care about how you're doing and i i loved it I, it was a it's a great small town and hey we're obviously we're still here we love it so post-secondary what what did you, what were your what did you choose to do um go to school did you what did you major in did you happen to play a sport did you continue with anything from high school what was that phase like for you yeah i i looked around at colleges and I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to go into, but I knew I wanted the option to be able to do gymnastics or track. I didn't know for sure if I'd want to do it, but I didn't want to pick a school and then decide on that school and then realize, oh shoot, now I, now I can't uh, do one of the sports I'd really like to do. So I had it narrowed down between Hamlin and the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire which it both had good gymnastics team or had gymnastics teams and track teams. So either choice, it, it would let me have those options. And I remember my dad saying to me, well, you know, you can go to four years of Eau Claire for about the same price as one year of Hamlin. So, so what do you think? <laughs> so I um, ended up over at Eau Claire and sure. My freshman year I did, I competed in gymnastics and I competed in track and it was, it was fun. I wouldn't change a thing, but I only did that one year because it, it was too much to go from one sport to the next in college like that. So the following my sophomore year, I just did gymnastics, um, had a great experience as far as teammates went, but not such a great experience my sophomore year with our, with our coaching. So I decided to take a break from that in my junior year, instead of competing for the college team, I coached the Chippewa Falls High School gymnastics team instead. And then my senior year, a new coach came in and I went back out for gymnastics again my senior year. Awesome. So then let's fast forward all the way to like today. Right. Of course, there's a lot in between <laughs> Eau Claire and where we are in the Zoom today, but uh, just kind of like zoom us up to speed. So tell us about uh, what you're doing now, right? Uh, the occupation you're living in, in the community, uh, but just tell us about your family and, and what you're up to right now. Sure. So I graduated from Eau Claire with a degree in early childhood special education. 
Uh, my first job out of college was for Matamidai schools. And right now I am in my 25th year in Matamidai. I, I love it there. It's been a wonderful experience. So there I work with preschoolers with special needs the year before they head to kindergarten. And some of them I support in their kindergarten year as well. So that's the professional side of what I do. Uh, my husband, Rick, and I both graduated from Hastings in 91. Um, didn't date until we were done with college. And um, we got married in 97. And since then, we've had three kids. We have Jack, Joe, and Jed. Um, Jack's done with college now. Joe's a sophomore at Mankato. And Jed is an eighth grader. And um, all of the boys were um, or are student athletes. So Jack and Joe both competed in um, high school or middle school and high school soccer. And Jed's a big soccer player too, but he's only in eighth grade. So he hasn't had his high school experience with it yet. And, you know, we live... Um, we live just outside of Hastings. We're actually on the quote unquote back 40 of the farm that I grew up on. So my mom and dad are just over the hill and the boys could run over to their house without having to go on a street or a road when they were little. And it's, it's great to have mom and dad that close. And I'm kind of back right in the hay field where I used to do my gymnastics, <laughs> my gymnastics routines on the on the hay wagon so awesome yeah so in what ways might your high school sports experience still impact you today any particular you know takeaways or lessons that are still a part of you as a parent or a or an educator or just otherwise as a person i think i think i learned to be persistent and you know, when, when you get asked to say words to describe yourself, you know, I always used to say competitive because I, I am, I, I, I'm really competitive, but I think that has faded a little bit in, in some situations because there just isn't that need to be that competitive anymore. But I feel like um, being persistent and um, staying positive I think, you know, Mr. Sandcamp for sure helped me learn, you know, that that side of, of staying positive with things. Mr. Vite too would always say with the right mental attitude, all the problems in the world will not make you a failure. Yet with the wrong mental attitude, all the help in the world will not make you a success. I just I remember him pounding that into us. And so I think that, you know, I, I feel that I'm a persistent hopefully positive, hopefully pleasant person to be around. And, and I think, I think that, you know, just these sports experiences really helped lead me down that path and have a different understanding of what it means to, to work hard and stick with something. And yeah, I, I just feel like just all those different experiences put together, make you who you are. So um, yeah, and as a parent, I think, you know, I, I try not to, to live my sports career through my kids. I, re I really wanted the boys to wrestle. My dad was a, a wrestler. He was the, uh, a captain of the Hastings wrestling team in 1958. And boy, when I had boys, you know, I, it was just me and my sister. So dad never got his boy that he wanted. I was the closest he got to it with all the sports I was in, but you know, I just wanted those boys to wrestle and, and they didn't want to, they did a little bit really young with Mr. Vite in those little camps that he would do, but that just wasn't their thing. And I think, you know, just letting them be who they are and pick what they wanted to do and just support them and encourage them. And, and some of those same characteristics of being competitive and staying positive and staying passionate and persistent with what you're doing. I hope I was able to help them with that and just take it with with their passions and not necessarily mine. You're doing a nice job of helping me segue into my into my next question. You've done a great job. Here, this is great. Um, we're, we're kind of reaching the tail end of the of the interview, and so which is this has been awesome to to listen uh, to you walk us through this. This is kind of the. Um, the moment where I just want to allow you to kind of talk to the audience a little bit right assuming that. Um, 
there's sports parents and likely even in a lot of cases, sports athletes, you know, current high school kids themselves are going to grab pieces of this, right? So let's take the student athlete piece first. I mean, if you could give current student athletes, think of a high school sophomore or junior, if you can give them one or two pieces of advice from your perspective, what would it, what would you say? What would you leave them with? I'd leave them with the work hard and, and give it all you can right now, because before you know it, it's over and done and you don't want to look back and say, oh, I, I wish I would have. So I hope for them that they have coaches that can push them the, the right way. And yeah, I, I feel so fortunate, Trent, that I had those coaches that just knew my personality and knew how hard to push. So I, I hope for the student athletes now that they have coaches that that see their potential and push them the right way and give them those just right challenges that aren't so hard that they lose them and not so easy that it's not not fun and challenging. So I just say, give it your all and don't leave any anything to question. Love it. So then let's talk, uh, how about from the parent point of view, right? So you've been an athlete, you know, we're fortunate to have your parents and, and involved in your own experience as an athlete, but you're, you've coached yourself. So you've worked with athletes and parents in that format and you are a sports parent yourself, right? Talk about your kids being in, in activities. So with that sports parent, right? So you're, now it's your audience is a, a parent of a sophomore, a parent of an eighth grader, a parent of a third grader. What's your, what's your piece or two of advice for sports parents of other kids today? Oh, yeah, I, I think you just have to meet your kids where they're at and just help, help them grow from the spot they're at to where you think their potential can be. And I, I think we just get, and I, I am guilty of it too, we just get so wrapped up in some of the intense, sometimes political pieces of sports and if we can just step back and you know are they having fun you know is this experience going to lead them down a path of um, being able to have a conversation 30 years from now like I can have with you and say wow you know those coaches I had and those experiences I had really set me up to be able to be a good teacher, be a good um, a teammate with my team at school and know how to push myself and know how to keep things fun so that it's not so heavy. So when we look at our kids and what we're asking them to do, are we giving them those same experiences? Or are we just running them ragged, having them try this and that and pushing them into activities that maybe aren't their choice? So I don't know, just keep a finger on the pulse of how it's going for them and, and hope that they can have a great experience. Well stated. So let me uh, thank you again. This is awesome. Just under an hour of your time to kind of take us back, back through that, um, you know, sports journey as a gymnast and, and a track and field athlete and kind of walk us through what it was like for you and kind of how you prepared, what was rewarding, uh, you've given us some good insight into the coaching and the teammates that you've had. You've paid it forward into um, kind of some takeaways for today. So uh, really appreciate taking the time. We look forward to kind of polishing this thing and getting it published so people have a chance to listen to it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Trent. <laughs>